Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the first video in this tutorial series on how to program a game in C Sharp for beginners. Well, not absolute beginners, but I would say intermediate beginners. Uh, so I do expect you to know the basics of coding, know the C Sharp syntax, and do have some basic understanding of object-oriented programming. So if you never heard any of these terms, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is probably not a video for you, but maybe I'm wrong, maybe you can learn something from this, maybe you can take something out of this. But before I go into the actual coding, um, I just want to go through some visuals and uh, through some uh, design concepts that I just quickly made, uh, just to show you uh, what we're going to do, uh, give you a basic idea of how it works, and uh, yeah, how it can be used for what we want to achieve right okay um, and I know theory might be dry and boring sometimes um, but if you think about it in programming the actual coding is just it's just a very small part of the actual work um, in, in programming what you actually do or in game design um, well programming in general you could say is develop logical concepts uh, create logical patterns or schemes um, that interact with each other and work together to uh, make up whatever it is you want to create uh, a game in this case um, right so I will just show you this beautiful breathtaking uh, diagram I just made and it shows you the game loop and the game loop um, is what basically keeps your game updated. Um, your game needs to needs to have a structure um, that allows it to constantly go through its game logic and then render whatever happens in the game on the screen um, on a regular basis, right? Um, so uh, a very simple game loop should look like this. Um, first, we're going to load the content that, we, that we're going to need. That means the assets, the resources that our game is going to use. Um, and that includes like sound files, uh, sprite sheets, textures in general, um, stuff like that. And the next step is the initialization. This is where we just uh, set any values that need to be set, set references, um, basically just do everything that we only need to do once before we go into actually handling our game logic, right? Just this is where we set things up. And then we go into the most important steps, um, which is updating your game logic. You can call this method update or you can call it tick, uh, whatever you prefer. Um, and after that, we're going to render all, our, of all of our stuff to the screen. And then we're going to repeat these two steps. Um, we could do this, uh, for example, we can do this um, at a target frame rate of 60 FPS, or we could do 50 FPS. Uh, I prefer to, to use 60 FPS um, because of the um, monitor refresh rate that is mostly used, which is 60 Hertz, um, so that it, it works together really well. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is how we're going to handle time in our game. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, delta time is uh, going to be a value that stores the time that elapsed between the previous frame and the current frame. And this is to make the game frame rate independent. I will get into that uh, in a second. Um, obviously, uh, if we if we're gonna uh, set up our game loop to run at a uh, to run at a target frame rate of 60 FPS, um, delta time will always be around 0 0.016666, um, because if you just simply divide one second by 60 frames, this is the result, and this is what delta time will be most of the time, right? I will get it, uh, into that later. Um, and time scale uh, is, a is a value uh, 
to manipulate this delta time value um, for several purposes. Um, with that, we could like simulate slowing down, or speeding up time. And one of the most practical uses for that is uh, one way uh, to implement pausing the game. You can also do fancy stuff like uh, slow motion and bullet time effects and fast forwarding time. Um, this is just to scale time, as, as it says, right? Um, now back to delta time. We're going to need that. We're going to need that to make the game frame rate independent. Um, well, we said that uh, we're going to keep, keep our game updated at 60 frames per second. Well, that's a that's a regular value, right? We can um, we could just rely on that. We could just say, well, it's it's going to be rendered at 60 frames per second. So we can just say, um, if this is our hero here, uh, let's call him uh, John. John should move uh, 10 pixels each frame when we press a button, right? Press any key on the on the keyboard. Go 10 frames in this direction. Um, and do this over and over, whatever. Um, but let's say uh, your machine can't handle this 60 FPS frame rate. Uh, for some reason, the frame rate drops to like, let's say 30, that's <laughs> the easiest way. Let's say it drops to 30. Um, well, how does it affect uh, John? Well, we said that every time it updates, he should move 10 pixels. But it's not going to update uh, as often because we're now at, a, at half the frame rate, right? So what does it mean? That means that John is going to be slowed down. John is only going to move 10 pixels um, every, let's see, every point zero three 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 second because that's one divided by 30 right um so john is now slower <laughs> we don't we don't want that we want to avoid that so that's why we keep track of delta time we're trying we're trying to target we're trying to uh make it stable at 60 fps we, we can't guarantee that right so maybe your machine drops the frame rate uh, and so instead of saying John has to move 10 pixels each frame, we're basically going to say John has to move 10 pixels a second, which is pretty slow, but it's just theory. Um, 10 pixels a second instead of 10 pixels a frame. And we're going to achieve that by just scaling the, the value that is... Uh, the 10 pixels that he should move uh, by this uh, delta time value, right? It's fairly easy because uh, if you multiply your value, in this case the 10 pixels, by this value, you're going to get a pretty low value. <laughs> um, but if it drops to 30 FPS, this will be double the amount, and that means that uh, John is going uh, is gonna move double the amount of pixels uh, as it as he would if the target frame rate was still 60, right? So no matter the frame rate, he's always going to move uh, the same amount in the same time. That's the idea behind this. All right. So without further ado. Let's get into some even further ado. Um, I want to show you uh, what we're going to work with. Um, we're going to use an open source library uh, to handle all the rendering stuff and all the uh, file loading, the, co the content loading. Um, uh, it, it could even handle networking for us, but we're not going to do that. We're just going to keep it really simple. Um, all this stuff that you really don't want to reinvent you really don't want to handle yourself uh, in this case of course um, it's going to do for us and uh, this 
library I'm talking about is SFML, which is originally um, a C++ uh, library, but there's a C-sharp wrapper for it, and it's, it works perfectly fine. I just, I just, um, I've been using it for prototyping and stuff like that. Um, it's a pretty neat little library. Um, speaking of neat libraries, um, what I highly recommend to any C-sharp programmer, any C-sharp pr uh, game programmer, that is, uh, I highly recommend to use Monogame. It is just an awesome framework. It's an open source implementation of the uh, Microsoft XNA framework. Um, it's cross-platform, so you can uh, develop for uh, iOS, Android, like anything you can think of. It's it's just perfect. I just love it. It's, it's really nice, and it does so much for you, and you can just focus on actually creating the, the game logic, and it's it's just awesome. I just... I just recommend it. But since we want to keep it simple and we want to learn how to make a game loop ourselves, um, we're just going to use SFML. It's a very, very uh, lightweight little library um, that only handles the the basic stuff for us. All right. Um, since I assume you know how to download stuff, um, just go ahead and download it. Um, I think uh, it's best for you to not download the 64-bit uh, version of it, but instead uh, use the 32-bit version of it, because um, as you know, any 32-bit application can run on a 64-bit machine, but not the other way around. So, all right, um, I guess you get the idea, right? So. Once you got it downloaded, um, you will need um, these libraries that are included here in this lib folder. And um, you want to reference these in your IDE. Speaking of IDE, normally I would highly and strongly recommend you to use Visual Studio because there's no better IDE for C Sharp development out there, period. It's just for .NET uh, languages like C Sharp, F Sharp, Visual Basic, whatever. Um, it is just the best uh, development software. Um, but uh, for this video series, for this tutorial series, I'm going to use uh, an, an open source alternative to Visual Studio. Um, just because, uh, very simple reason, I only got Visual Studio in German and I don't want to fiddle with the preferences. I don't want to fiddle with the options, I don't want to mess with it. Um, so the open source IDE that I'm going to use is called Sharp Develop. And you can find it on this website, icsharpcode.net, um, as a free download. Um, but like I said, I recommend you to use Microsoft Visual Studio instead. You can download that. If you don't have it already, you can download the community version of it for free. Um, but if you want to use Sharp Develop um, instead, just go ahead and download it. It's only around 30 or 40 megabytes in size. So that's one selling point of it, uh, if it, if it was sold. Um, but what I like most about Sharp Develop is that you can uh, use it on a USB flash drive. It's portable. You can just put it on any external device and take it with you. And that's really neat because if you're, if you're a student, for example, you can just take it with you to, to college or university, whatever, um, whenever you got a spare, whenever you got some uh, time to spare, uh, just go to the next available computer, put your flash drive in, and you can keep on coding wherever you are. And that's great. Um, all right, so let's finally get started. But first, we need to set up SFML in our IDE, but that's just a few clicks. All right, so now that we're finally in our IDE, we can finally start um, by creating a new solution. And uh, we're just going to use a console application template as a starting point. It's just a good uh, start to what we want to do. Um, name your project whatever you want. I'm just gonna keep. Uh, I'm just gonna call it tutorial game, 
and click create. Wait a second. All right. I'm actually running this from a USB device as we speak. So that that's why sometimes it might take a little more time uh, than usual whenever it does stuff but uh, it's not it's not that big a deal all right so now we got our hello world uh, console all set up and what we're gonna do next and what we need to do next is reference the libraries that we just downloaded um, and it's pretty simple and I hope you already know how to do this um, in sharp develop you just go to references and click add reference then go to net assembly browser click browse and then go to your libraries and then select all of these sfml dll's and click ok ok perfect um, but that's not enough um, we also need to include these external libraries that the sfml library relies on so but we don't want to reference it we want to copy all of this um, and then we go to our um, to the project that we just created uh, to the to the path of it and just go right into it right here where the app config is located and where the program uh, class that we just created uh, is located and then we just paste all of those external libraries right here inside okay all right and then we go back into uh, sharp develop or visual studio all right so now that we're back in sharp develop or visual studio um, there's one last thing we need to do and that's um, we're going to need to um, change the output type of our um, application because we just we just created a console application but we need it to be a Windows application so in sharp develop you just go to your solution right here click uh, do a right click and go to properties and the first thing that will show up is application and you just change the output type to Windows application okay and of course save the change all right we can close that now and now we can start coding finally 